Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for all that you are and for all that you do and for all that you give to us. May we hear these words from your holy scriptures this morning in ways that opens our hearts, enlivens our minds, lifts up our spirits, and challenges us to live in the way that you call us to live as a response to all that you have given to us. May you be glorified and honored in all that we say and think. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week's sermon on the story of Zacchaeus was a wonderful introduction to stewardship. And David so eloquently said in his sermon, Zacchaeus was a sinful man, a tax collector, who took more from the people than the government required and pocketed it for himself. But upon meeting Jesus, his heart was broken, his life was changed and transformed, and he recognized Jesus as his Lord. And his response was to make amends. Half of my possessions, he said, I will give to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone, I shall pay them back four times what I owe them. What a beautiful description of how meeting Jesus in person transforms our lives. Now, our lectionary passage for today is supposed to be from Luke 20, where the Sadducees came, which were religious leaders, came to Jesus with a question about the resurrection. But the question really wasn't a question because they don't believe in the resurrection. And as I read over that passage, I thought, that doesn't fit with Stewardship Sunday, although it is a discussion about death. And the resurrection reminds us that we cannot take it with us. We need to invest it while we're here. There is a story of a man who tried to take it with him. He could not bear to part with his wealth, so he had it all converted to gold bars and put it in a suitcase. When he died, somehow he managed to take that suitcase with him. And at the pearly gates, Peter noticed the suitcase and asked, what's inside? The man opened the case and proudly displayed all the gold bars he had there. Oh, good, said Peter. New pavers for the streets. Such is the value of wealth in heaven. So instead, today we're going to be reading from Luke 19, verses 11 to 26. Jesus has just finished talking to Zacchaeus, and he goes on to tell the people another parable about the kingdom of God. It is one of his last teachings before his final week in Jerusalem. In it, there are three groups of people, the noblemen, the servants, and the citizens under the rule of the noblemen, and all present very distinctive lifestyles and relationships to the noblemen. Listen now for the word of the Lord. As they were listening to Jesus tell about talk with Lazarus, he went on to talk, tell us, well, let's start this over. As he was, as they were listening to Jesus tell about Lazarus, Zacchaeus, I'm sorry, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to get royal power for himself and then return. He summoned ten of his slaves and gave them ten pounds and said to them, do business with these until I come back. But the citizens of his country hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to rule over us. When the nobleman returned, having received royal power, he ordered the slaves to whom he had given the money to be summoned so that he might find out what they had gained by trading. The first came forward and said, Lord, your pound has made 10 pounds. Jesus said, well done, good slave. Because you have been trustworthy in a small thing, 
take charge of 10 cities. Then the second slave came forward saying, Lord, your pound has made five pounds. And Jesus said to him, and you rule over five cities. Then another came saying, Lord, here is your pound. I wrapped it in a piece of cloth for I was afraid of you because you are a harsh man. You take what you do not deposit and you reap what you do not sow. Jesus said to him, I will judge you by your own very words, you wicked slave. You knew, did you, that I was a harsh man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? Then when I, would have, when I returned, I could have collected it with interest. Jesus said to the bystanders, take the pound from him and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. And bystanders said, Lord, he already has 10 pounds. I tell you, said Jesus, those who have more will be given. And from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. This is the word of the Lord. It would be easy in this sermon to point at the man who did nothing with the money entrusted to him, who hid what the master had given to him, who never increased his pledge and ended up on the doorstep of hell. Or it would be easy to criticize the citizens for wanting their own way and telling the noblemen they did not want him to rule over them. But before we take comfort in criticizing the one man or the citizens, let me assure you this is not the approach I believe in taking. Strong arm tactics are not my style, nor am I one to try and manipulate others using guilt or shame or fear. And while this parable does refer to money in its story, it's not really about money. It's about God's kingdom and the kind of relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Today's parable begins innocently enough. A master distributes his wealth to 10 servants before going on a long trip. Each servant was given a pound to invest while the master was away. In some translations and in other places of the Bible in Matthew in particular, this story, the word talent is used. But this can be confusing because a talent in those days had nothing to do with ability, but it rather referred to a Greek word that meant a coin, and not just any coin, but rather a coin that represented a huge sum of money. Scholars today believe that one talent, or pound, would equal the amount of money a laborer in Jesus' day would earn over 15 to 20 years of working. In today's numbers, that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 dollars to $700,000. That's a lot of money to be entrusted to manage. In the meantime, kind of like an interruption, the citizens who hated the nobleman sent a delegation after him, telling him, we don't want you to rule over us. I've often wondered why this was put in the middle of the paragraph, or the parable. It doesn't seem to fit. But I think it is here as another example of the impact of our relationship with God the citizens were only focused on their own plans, their own agenda. They represent those who insist on life on their terms. They often succeed because of their very determination to get what they want. But having it all on your own terms is a mixed blessing. For unfortunately, enough is never enough. That's how we're made. We can have it all, and yet somehow the hunger for more is never fulfilled. Our preoccupation with possessions more than anything else prevents us from living freely and with joy. And it interferes with our relationship with God. 
For when we're focused on our own agenda and preoccupied with wealth and possessions, then God ceases to have the first place in our life. But there it is. So the nobleman goes on his way to receive royal power. And upon his return, he asks for an accounting from each of the servants. One, we learn, invested ten pound, one pound and made ten pounds. For this, he is given the responsibility to rule over ten cities and is commended for his investment. Another increased his pound to five pounds and was given the responsibility to rule over five cities. Another took his pound and hid it in a handkerchief. His reason was that he saw the ruler as a harsh man who takes what he does not deposit and reaps what he does not sow. The ruler then judges the man by his very own words and is a harsh ruler. He takes the pound the man has and gives it to the one with ten. Now, we might be tempted to think that this servant was irresponsible and stupid, by hiding the money, but that was common practice in those days. So what made the difference between the first two servants and the third? What enabled the first two to take risks with what had been entrusted to them, while the third was unable to do so? The clue is in the relationship the servants had with the nobleman. The third Servant saw the master as a harsh man. Consequently, the servant is afraid, and his fear immobilizes him so that the best he can do is hide the pound that he has been given. He is so afraid that he cannot even bring himself to take the pound to the first Hebrew bank of Galilee and put it in a certificate of deposit. All this because he had no trust or faith in his master. He was unable to take any risks with the pound he had. Risk is certainly a theme of Christian faith. Those who say faith is a crutch are wrong. To put my trust in someone or something requires taking a risk. When you came in here this morning and sat in these pews, You trusted that they would hold your weight. It's actually pretty risky to put your weight in a chair or a pew. Not that I'm commenting on anyone's need to diet. But to sit in a chair, you're trusting that the construction of that chair or pew is stronger than the gravity that is pulling you towards the floor. You're trusting that you will not end up on the floor with a broken tailbone. In a similar manner, placing your life, your future, your resources, your money in Christ means taking a risk. You are trusting that God is trustworthy and that God is capable of doing what God has promised, namely giving you peace and hope and joy now and eternal life later meaning also that you can be a part of the work of God's kingdom and participate in what God is doing here on earth. That's why we call it a covenant, because it's a promise between yourself and God. Now, we can do so because we believe that God is trustworthy and because we believe that God is good And we believe that God has the power and the integrity not only to enable us, but to do what God has promised for us. Living and acting in faith means taking risks. It's risky to witness of your faith to another, to share your beliefs not knowing how they'll be received. It's risky to serve others, for you're choosing to spend your time helping others by teaching Sunday school, feeding those who are less fortunate, giving Christmas gifts to a needy family. And there's no guarantee how that service will be received or what the outcome of your efforts will be. 
It is risky to love in a way that Christ loves. You might be hurt. You might look foolish. How can we serve, witness, love, and give if it's not through the power of God? We can do that because of our relationship with a God who empowers us to do those things and as a response to the wonderful gifts that God has given to us. The nobleman expected the servants to invest, invest the money he had given them, to trusted and believed in him and were able to take the risk to do so. And their reward was twofold. They were given even greater responsibility and they were allowed the joy of being in the presence of the master. The third servant did not trust or believe and was not able to take any risks. And his reward was a loss of responsibility and removal from the presence of the ruler. Like the third servant, the citizens saw the nobleman as someone they chose not to like or trust. And they tried to manipulate him with their own agenda, but it did not work. And their relationship with the ruler remained broken. I believe the servants got exactly what they expected. Two expected a generous and faithful ruler and were rewarded with the same. They had what you might call a philosophy of abundance. They saw the master as gracious and delighted in using and investing what he had given them. One servant expected a harsh and cruel master and in turn received a stiff punishment. He had what might be called a philosophy of scarcity. His fear of the master and fear of loss kept him from seeing and enjoying the graciousness of the ruler. Have you ever given a gift and known that it was never used? Maybe a check that was never cashed, or clothes that were never worn, a tool that was never used, a coupon or certificate that was never redeemed probably made you wonder just how grateful the recipient really was. The question for us today is, which of the characters in this story do we identify with? Are we like the first two servants who know that what they have is a gift from the master to be invested and used and given for the work of God's kingdom? Or are we like the third servant who sees the master as harsh, taking what does not belong to him? Or are we like the citizens who resent the master and ask him to stay out of their lives? Faithfulness is a willingness to risk what we are given, a willingness to invest what we have received from the Lord and invest it in the work of the Lord, whether we have much or whether we have little. God expects us to respond to what he gives in joyful faith, to take a risk out of gratitude and thanksgiving and awe and wonder to this faithful, loving, gracious God because we know God is a gracious God and we know that God is faithful and trustworthy. For that reason, we can invest what God gives us. Praise be to the Lord. Amen.